1976 BBC miniseries I Claudius is definitely bare bones when compared to the lavish productions we have today. Sets are clearly studio built with that famous fourth wall ever hidden and whatever's more expensive than a stabbing is cast to off-screen territory. And yet these 13 episodes are more creatively directed than over 90% of everything you'll see today, whether TV or film. Evidently, quality of wits is more important than quantity. Like other BBC productions of the era, I, Claudius is unquestionably stage play-like. Long, dialogue-heavy scenes in sparsely decorated, repeated interior sets. Nothing cinematically extravagant could be done, so directors were limited to moving their actors and heavy cameras as best they could to make the story visual. You listen to me. Mark Anthony was twice the man you are. And when he spat on my sister, he learned a lesson that he didn't live long enough to profit from. With the help of marvelous dialogue and a perfect guest, director Herbert Wise made I, Claudius a paragon of robust blocking and strong yet unobtrusive camera work. Wise makes scenes cinematic by having his actors rearrange themselves on screen non-stop. They use every corner of the set and the frame. Left and right, foreground, middle ground and background. And the camera moves alongside them always with purpose, either following an action, searching for a reaction or reframing for effect. With me the camera is always an actor. It's very, very rarely uh, an observer. Takes are unusually long for today's standard and thanks to the effective choreography of camera and actors, they keep the need to cut down to a minimum. There was a wonderful rapport between yourself and the, and the camera and the changing of the camera and the cameras were dancing and so were you. Now let's check three examples of these great shots. The noble senator Incitatus. In one of the show's best scenes and takes, Caesar Augustus confronts a room full of senators who slept with his daughter. We start off in a close-up of a letter and move back to Augustus, as seen from behind the senators in the foreground. He gloomily walks to the right and the camera follows, comically revealing just how many of his co-workers have shagged his daughter. Slowly moving back to the left, he questions them, one crestfallen future corpse at a time. What, Caesar? Ah, only once, that's all. Some excellent dialogue and deliciously complex acting from Brian Blessed while it happens. Not slept, Caesar. Not slept? You mean it happened standing up, perhaps? Or in the street, or on a bench? He reaches the end of the line, where the take began. And as he shows his fury moving to the middle ground, we move to the right again, this time quickly. Is there anyone in Rome who has not slept with my daughter? The men are taken out as we approach Augustus, who is now our foreground. No, no! I'm alright. He gets a close-up as his emotions take hold. You punish her. Punish her for life. Don't tell me where she's gone, don't ever mention her name! In a little over three minutes we get Augustus being incredulous, mocking, furious and weepy. The camera goes back, right, left, right and forward, always following and enhancing the drama on screen. Perfection! But here's a scene I like even more. Here, Livilla wants to know if her lover Sejanus has been given permission to marry her. Prepare for a blocking like you'll never see today. She inquires and he tells her about the refusal while he undresses in the back. He approaches her to pick up wine cups. Then you must try again, later. As he tries to end her hopes of marriage, he walks around the first bed. Sejanus left middle, Livilla right back. She repeats his movement recommending another course of action. They're now close again. And she tries to be romantic, so the camera pushes in on the couple. Darling, all that I have done, I have done for one reason, and that is to give us the right to be together. He gives terrible news. He'll marry her daughter instead, and he does so by circling the second bed. Sejanus front right, Livilla left middle. She is livid and rushes to him, fists flailing. I'll kill you! He throws her on the second bed. 
He circles it to face her, but she turns away from him. It shows how displeased she is and conveniently permits us, the camera, to see both their faces. Slight reframing and he forces her to face him. While he reveals his plans for the future, the angle turns into his close-up. He kisses her, guiding the camera in the act to her close-up. What did the scene tell us? It started with Levilla thinking she would marry Sejanus. He reveals it won't happen. She insists and he reveals he'll marry her daughter. She throws a fit, he forces her to calm down and he tells his plans. She can do nothing else but comply. This scene is terrific, dramatic and narratively important. He suggested a marriage with your daughter. It travels through different emotions, it reveals plot and character. Livilla goes from hopeful, to incredulous, to angry, to resigned. Sejanus goes from indifferent, to tactful, to stern, to cold. This level of writing is exemplary. Hooray to Jack Bullman! And director Herbert Wise makes the visuals as effective as the words. We can easily witness every beat happening on screen. We see Sejanus moving away, then going casually to the wine. We see him creating distance between them as he prepares to deliver the news, and we see her insisting on being close to him. When she's defeated, she's forced to lie down. And once it's over, we get our closest view of their faces. I was able for the camera to tell the story as much as an actor would tell a story. It contributed as much, because you can tell so much more in a camera movement or a sudden cut to a close-up than you can do in words. Hey, in case you're learning something, how about liking and subscribing? It will help you get more videos like this one. In the final scene, we'll go through, two advisors try to convince Emperor Claudius to get a new wife. Each of them pleads for a different woman. That's all the context I'll give. The directing will tell you the rest. Pallas and Narcissus position themselves around an inert Claudius. As Narcissus pleads, Pallas is turned back. When Pallas pleads, Narcissus is turned back. Narcissus walks to the back, then they discuss further on the right of the frame. Claudius is still passive on the foreground as they argue in the back. They return. Then move to the left so Pallas can get some wine. Narcissus runs to Claudius as Pallas arrives in the back. The Emperor speaks for the first time, so both men and the camera close in to listen. It's just nonsense, so we move away. The Emperor prepares to leave, Pallas by his side. Narcissus has his arm on the foreground. It will be used. Claudius makes his choice and exits. Pallas triumphantly throws his cup to Narcissus. That's why his arm has been here. He turns to us and sits down in defeat. This is visual storytelling. The camera and the actor's bodies working as one with the screenplay to tell you the story. I will bury my niece. Nowadays, even with all their impressive production design, advanced technology and millions of dollars, directors refuse to do anything more sophisticated than cutting between close-ups. Most scenes today are static and ever similar. You bring them death, and they will love him for it. Even in a series as great as HBO's Rome, the dialogue and the actors' faces must do all the heavy lifting. But I, Claudius, remains to prove that when the director is willing to arrange his players, to choose the right angle, to do more than the minimum, the camera can speak as eloquently as the best dialogue. And the head is merely part of an actor, a part we can often do without.